I am unashamed. What about you? Welcome back to Unashamed. Uh, I have uh, come to the Southern Lair uh, for a podcast today. So, Dad, looks like I left uh, at the perfect time. You had a little. Uh, we had some trees down out there in your area. We didn't. weren't even sure be be able to use the lair today because of uh, you had a pretty good little uh, brouhaha come through yesterday, huh? If what you, was that like? If you live in the woods, we just got a just like a trail going down to the, then it just plays out. And it's all woods, river on one side, ri- woods on the other. From time to time, a wind to come along, and if it's if the wind is 20, 25 miles an hour, which is not real big, but some of it get up to 30, but fallen trees is a constant Yep. Which I, 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 we were just going there. So we have a big generator that kicks on when your power goes out. Well, yesterday, that wind kept getting rougher and rougher. One of them thunderclappers here in July, which you don't see very often, and it, that everything blinked, that means you just lost your power and your generator's fixing to kick in. So you just about, if you want to live trouble-free down in here, for the most part, you, you'd have a, a generator out there that can that can give you energy. So yep. yesterday, it just everything it clicked on takes for about ten seconds. Something that you know, you lose your power. A tree just knock your lines down. Well, we just got a generator out there. We'll go out, and you don't even go out have to look. It it'll just come on automatically. You got your power back, and it's no big deal. Sometime that lasts one hour, two hours. Sometime it lasts two days. Sometimes it lasts two weeks, depending on how rough the weather is. So all that stuff, you just take it in stride. I pulled up there to see what was going on, and the, the tree was in the middle of the road, across the road, and the wires. Well, the some guy about an hour later pulled up, LP and L power and light man. He had a little thing in his hand. He said, I can tell whether the wires are hot or not. I said, yeah, I don't have one of those. That's why I've been standing over here on the edge <laughs> looking over there where you are. <laughs> yeah. Because you could die in a hurry so if you, you get around them. Could three. you not travel down your road? You were blocked? Oh, block, blocked up, rocked up, couldn't get in. So I opened the gate for them because I knew they had to come at some point. Told Dan, Miss K called Dan. Dan called the power people. What were you doing, walking around? I was just going up there and inspect the damage. I'm saying, how did you get to the gate at the road? I mean, I drove up. I drove up to, to the log was across the road, and the gate's still up there. Oh, and then you walked up there. Yeah, you know, was, yeah. No, I didn't walk up there. I just got back from the wires, but 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 it was inside the gate. So I just told them to open the gate and leave it open oh, I so see. LP and L, the power people, yeah. could just come on in. We gave them the address. You got a log across the road. They, it's on the— How big a tree was this? Oh, it was an oak about like about like, about like that. Pretty big. Okay. Pretty big, but it was dead, and it just hit, busting in about two pieces. But it was too much. I, I could have. I was gonna winch it out of there once once they got it fixed. But they did all that for me, so that's pretty nice of them. Sometime between six o'clock yesterday evening, and oh no, I heard it. Even though I'm a few miles from you, it, the thunder and lightning was just rocking the oh, house. That's it. It's interesting because when we grew up out there, we uh, we were still fishing, so we didn't have the means by which to buy one of these generators, which are very nice. I got one in my house too, and um, so you just had to weather whatever happened <laughs> literally. And so I can remember some of those one week stretches when it was cold and when it was hot, where you didn't have any power. You just had to, we used to run water in the bathtub Remember, and, you know, cause you're coming out of a well, but when the, you lose power, then your pump goes out. So you can't get water either. So these was generators a, are the best thing you could ever purchase for yeah. us, especially way out in the middle of the woods. I mean, right. We just keep going for up to a month. That thing's got a big tank on it, fuel tank. So yeah. we just, I mean, it just, as soon as your electricity goes off, 
10 seconds. It's, it's rare. I don't forgot the name of that company. They're down there in Pineville or somewhere, Louisiana. So they, yeah, they should make you a sponsor. It, it's a nation. Uh, yeah, you should, yeah, I know what. I've been waiting on them to give me did, a check. I plug them all the time. <laughs> did you? <laughs> well, Phil, most people. They ain't sent me doodle squat. Most people don't go and, and buy a house in, the, in a flood zone in the middle of the woods at the end of a road. That is correct. So, yep. Uh, their audience may be limited as yeah, far it as has, it has its it drawbacks. <laughs> yeah. Did you think about the story where Jesus calmed the storm in Luke 8? No, but that would have been nice to have him. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, we had just studied but You that. know, trees can, can come down and do a lot of damage if they're in the wrong place. You know, well, yeah. we just had one a couple weeks ago that oh, I yeah. talked about. It fell, you know, across, right in front of our gate. So, falling trees are, are is a pretty well a constant. Oh, we had a sister, dad at the church. She's still around, but her younger sister, when she was just maybe ten years old, she was just walking along there in front of her house, and a tree fell on her and killed her. Oh, yeah. I mean, it happened. It happens all the time. It's it's dangerous. So, Jace, what about your weekend? Well, uh, you know, it's uh, it's been a week of a lot of, I guess, a lot of spiritual warfare. I guess just with you know with helping kids and marriages and different situations. You know, sometimes it's just it it tends to snowball. I guess when you're out there, you have relationships with people through the years. You bring a lot of people to Christ. And so every once in a while you just have those weeks where it's, it, it feels like it, you're running a business. For It's like when one person leaves, the next person, you know, knocks on the door and, and here we go. But uh, Missy and I took one night and she wanted to go to a movie because had, she had three movies that she wants to see, which is the first time she's actually wanted to see a movie in years. But I think at the top of the list was this movie, Sound of Freedom. It's to, it's the first time I've been to a movie besides The Blind, which we, what, what do you call that? Was it a private screening? That was kind of a private screening, yeah. But it was a full house. Oh, yeah. So we all were those packed. people were invited to be there, I guess? Correct. Oh, okay. Well, that was, so you take that out. I hadn't been to a movie theater in years. And so uh, we went and saw The Sound of Freedom. I wish I had gone sooner. So I, I was actually, uh, it was it was a tough watch. Really well done. Glad I went. Uh, and I want to, I don't know, I'm not involved with anybody who's putting that on, but after I saw that, I just would highly recommend people getting behind that and going and watching it. And uh, if you don't know what it's about, it's basically, it tells a true story of a guy who just stopped his life and tried to rescue children who were being used for sexual abuse. And uh, so it's based on a true story. But actually, after the movie was over, and I want to say this because you want to watch through the credits a little thing comes up and it's like special special message in maybe four minutes or whatever so missy's like i think we should watch this whatever it is so then the star of the movie caviezel is it jim yeah jim caviezel, jim caviezel. same guy who played jesus in the passion yeah he uh he he gave a very fantastic speech that I will encourage everyone to listen to. So, and this is one of those things where it's, you know, I wasn't sure what had happened. I'm a non-social media guy, so I don't want to give a wrong narrative of what's happening. But evidently, this movie was done five years ago, and they couldn't get it to be released. He called it roadblocks, and and what I kind of gathered is that you know most of the people in this industry of of having these arrangements with kids i mean they're kidnapping kids they turn them into slaves and then you have these really high rollers who are paying 
paying for this. I mean, it's sickening. That's why I said it's hard to watch. The fact that it's going on in our world, just it it physically made me nauseous. But uh, so maybe you know the impression was some some of the people, even in Hollywood and and government agencies and these uh, these companies that are worth billions, some of these high rollers are people doing these very same things. True. So which caused some roadblocks and. So they're trying to reveal the truth of what's going on and, and get the people to kind of rise up against it. So I'm in. Well, and it begs the question. I mean, look, I, I've done probably a little bit more looking into it than you have, and you're you're spot on. I mean, there's there's no doubt there are some powerful forces that have been at work against this coming out. And you mentioned spiritual warfare, Jason, when you first started talking about this. This is a classic, clear case of it. I mean, this oh, yeah. evil tries to protect evil. And so Caviezel and their crew and Angel Studios and all these people that got the movie out, kudos to them. And the movie's been doing fantastic, by the way. I mean, it's getting no help from media, and yet it's it's gone because it's so important. It was such an important topic. My deal yeah. is, look, uh, uh, no matter what side of this political spectrum you're on, left, right, whatever, libertarian, if you can't get behind protecting kids from sexual predators – I mean, you got a serious problem going on in your life. So th this is something that should be, everybody should be behind stopping this, number one, but also even being supportive, as you said, Jason, because this is this is a true story. This is a guy that, you know, he put his heart in. So we got a lot of other friends. You know, Remember we had Adam LaRoche on, Jason? That's what LaRoche is doing. And a lot of other mm -hmm. people, they're using now the means, the blessings they got from being a professional athlete, whatever, to yeah. save children. And so I, I can't think of a better thing to do, to be honest with you. Well, sometimes you got to be jolted, and uh, that's what this does. I, I completely understand why people like Adam LaRoche and other people are, are going off and doing this after I watched this. And it was it was a jolt, and it's kind of a pay-it-forward, ground roots type operation that they have. They're telling this story, and they're giving you the stats – and they made the movie, even though it's rated R, because it is disturbing to what very hard to watch. It's done in a way where there's not a lot of, you know, profanity, and it, you know they're they're trying to they tried to make it where even Christian people could watch it and not feel like they have to, you know, take a shower. But uh, so I just think it was well done. It, it needed to be done. I'm behind it 100%, and so I encourage our listeners to go watch the movie, and you, you'll you'll see why we led led you there. Well, it kind of, it kind of reminds you of that verse when Jesus said, you know, it's better to have a millstone, you know, or you get you know, to, around your neck and thrown into a deep pool of water than to mess with kids. And so, well, I don't want to get, yeah, I don't want to give you a spoiler, but the main star, Jim Caviezel actually said that in the movie good he quoted that and uh to a sexual predator that they had caught and that guy was like what 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 are you talking about because he had no idea obviously that that was a bible verse he didn't say that's in you know give the book chapter of verse he just said it which was basically his moment of saying you're fixed to go down <laughs> <laughs> you know, it was, but that's the kind of nuggets I liked about the movie. There was a spiritual yeah. undertone uh, in there, and that was one of the references made, which only a believer Bible studier would realize that that was a verse. <laughs> right, I'm sure right, most right. people didn't recognize that as a Bible verse. Well, that, but the best thing is that's straight from God's mouth to our ears. So let's uh, let's take our first break. So, Jace, uh, do you know if you got your life insurance uh, up to date and taken care of? Do you, is that a missy question, or do you know about how much life insurance you have? I'm sure I do, and my wife, she smiles when she brings that up. So I'm like, okay, we must be good on that. <laughs> well, you like, you like it if they're smiling. That's always good. <laughs> well, it's not something we really like to think about, but, you know, we want our family to be taken care of. We we talk a lot about eternal health insurance on this podcast, and that's the most important. 
But uh, but secondary is also a good life insurance plan that gives you some peace of mind that knows your family's taken care of no matter what happens to you. Um, and so our, we got some friends at Policy Genius, and what they do is help you find the best insurance rates. Uh, they know how valuable your time is, and so they're going to use technology uh, to make sure that you get the best deal. Uh, with Policy Genius, you can find life insurance policies that start at just twenty five dollars a month for a million dollars worth of coverage. Some options offer coverage in as little as a week and avoid unnecessary medical exams. So we like these guys. Uh, they're licensed. They have award winning agents. Uh, they're for parents, caregivers, anyone else uh, who has people that depend on them. So your loved ones deserve a financial safety net. You deserve a smarter way to find out and buy it. So head to policygenius.com slash Phil or click the link in the description to get your free life insurance quotes and see how you can save. That's policygenius.com slash Phil. So before we get to our Bible study, Jay, you mentioned that Missy wanted to see two or three movies. Can you mention the other ones she wants to see or did y'all talk about that? Uh, th- yeah, she you made won- the right choice because I, I have still haven't seen the film, but I'm going to this week. But I made another choice just because it was about to go off the theater. And so I saw a movie, too. I saw Guardians of the Galaxy. Which well, she wanted I- to see that. And, and now I realize why, because that was more of a spiritual decision. Sure. And so we that was at the top of the list. She wanted to see the uh, Harrison Ford Oh yeah, Raiders the of the Indiana Lost, Jones. Lost, Indiana Jones. Just because, I mean, it takes you back to when we were kids, and so, uh, and then the other, which I objected to because of the name, which is the new, I guess, and last Mission Impossible, <laughs> which I've always <laughs> taken on as it's a lie it's a- that I can't get past the name that they took a spiritual principle. <laughs> Mission Impossible, and then they uh, then he does it. Well, why why don't you name it Mission Possible? <laughs> you know Hebrews eleven six discusses things that are impossible. You cannot. Uh, uh, I mean, I'll I'll read that one. Uh, <laughs> Jace, Jace is not seeing it based on biblical ground. <laughs> no. <laughs> I mean, it makes me. If see. only they had called it Mission Possible yeah. back in the '60s when this series came out, Jace could have been on board. But well, Mission Impossible, nope. Look, I'm not sad that Hollywood is on strike. I don't know the details on why they are, but maybe it's because they're taking all of God's qualities and making movies about it. Get your own material. Quit coming up with Superman and Batman and all these people who can have all these special godlike qualities, you know, and they come back from the dead. You can't kill them. If you took out those imperishable qualities and impossible things happening that only God can provide, you'd cut your movie production (laughs) by three quarters, and then you wouldn't have to go on strike. So, and you know it's true. So Hebrews eleven six, I had a brain cramp, good memory. And without faith, it is impossible to please God because anyone who comes to him must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who earnestly seek him. So that would be a mission impossible. Which to is try true. to please God without faith. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Another one would be when Jesus, when he was in the tomb, it said it was impossible in Peter's sermon for death to keep its hold on him. Yep. Now that's what you need to do a movie about. Do it about. I think they're doing it. Jesus, who the uh, the only person on the planet where it was impossible for death to keep him. Now that's something to ponder. Are they? I think. I think so. I heard. I've heard that next year, uh, Mel Gibson has the the sequel to The Passion coming out and I, I don't know I've just heard this so I, I, don't, I don't know if this, that's factually accurate but you remember at the end of the passion yeah it shows Jesus sit up and he he's you see his hand and there's a hole through it well you I'm know, just they, well I'm irritated so, that it took this long because the well, Bible narrative you know, was three days it's been what 30 years 
It's been a long time. <laughs> well, you know, it's easier. It was easier for Jesus to come back from the dead than it is to get a movie made in Hollywood. That, to your point earlier about this sound of freedom. So, well, that's what kind of got my my blood boiling is when I realized that some powers that be tried to block this movie. Now I realize yeah. it's a hard thing to watch. You know, I don't know if that was the reason, but I'm like, it's obviously a mission. It's a movie with a mission. They're, they're trying to draw attention to what's going on in our world, and it's an epidemic. I mean, there's more people in this sexual slave world than there was the entire slavery epidemic. Oh yeah. Uh, you know, in the eighteen that you know in the eighteen hundreds that started. I mean, th- this is a problem, and children are being abused, and we should rise up as a world and try to do something about it. It's a great point, Jace. And all, all you hear talked about with slavery is from 150 plus years, now 170 years ago and reparations and all this stuff. When actually we should be talking about this, because this is happening in real time. It's what happens when you, you, you don't live a life because of your depravity. Depravity becomes mainstream. It's, it's a tough story. It's a tough world in, uh, Al. You know what I'm saying? That's, that's a depraved mind. Now, look, we had, remember we had Beam on uh, recently on a podcast, Joe Beam. And remember what he based the whole evil structure on? Was it Paul's description, Ephesians 4.18? Darkened in your understanding, separated from the life of God, Because of the ignorance that is in them due to the hardening of their hearts, they lose all sensitivity and then give themselves over to sensuality so as to indulge in every kind of impurity with a continual lust for more. Yep. I mean, you're just watching a a slide into depravity like you just described, and it it begins with darkening, you know, just... Just well, it's, no it, light. And a lot they draw attention to a lot of these these people with a lot of money, and I mean as in billions, you know, they'll buy an island somewhere where they feel like there's no rules that apply and they're just gonna do whatever they wanna do. And that involves kidnapping children and taking them to the island as sex objects. Right. Well, you know. Well, if you can't draw a line in the sand there, and so the reason yeah. we're they're having so much trouble getting people to take notice because the same people with all that money, they don't want you looking into their island. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, it, it it'll make you mad. It, it, it's a it's an emotional roller coaster. So, uh, but I highly recommend it. It's something you remember Joe said, which I thought was really powerful because we were, and this will kind of get us, I guess, back into Luke, but we were in Luke chapter eight. And, you know, he said that we focus so much when we study these passages about demon possession because it was there. He said, but actually the the demons and Satan himself work much more on manipulation than possession. In other words, the manipulation and the darkening of hearts is far more common than possession. I mean, possession is is crazy to read, and and when you see it, I guess it's it's amazing to watch. But actually, what they do in manipulation and seduction of people and hearts is far more prevalent and, and way more dangerous in the long term than than even a possession could be. So I, I thought that was intriguing when he made that point. Yeah, it really, really is. We got to have him back. You think oh, of yeah. a, you think of a human being, and and you say, well. What's this person's problem? And you read in, in verse uh, about 31, chapter 1 of chapter 2 of uh, the book of Romans, they are senseless, so you don't have any sense. They are faithless, no God whatsoever. They're heartless, you say, Man, come on! I mean, what, what? You know, you're actually going to do that to a little child, and then they're ruthless. Well, if you are senseless, faithless, heartless, and ruthless, there's not much left to you, pal. Yeah, it's all bad then. Just yeah, horrendous. that's a good, accurate depiction of that movie. What the battle was that about? Is, it was people with those four qualities. Yeah, uh, I mean, yeah. I, I hadn't ever been to a movie where I was physically nauseous before, but. I mean, that that was the first one. 
But which is I don't want that to deter you because you need to be nauseous about this. Yeah, well, it's like it's like people that couldn't go see watch the Passion because they're like it's just too brutal. And I'm like, yeah, but that really happened. I mean, we we've been studying the Jesus crucifixion and and uh, torture our whole lives, and somebody finally put it in a format that we could actually see it. And so I think that's powerful. Let's take another break. So, Dad, I think it's uh, pretty safe to say we got a pretty crazy world uh, going on out there in our culture. Is that a is that a fair statement? That is a exact statement. So, you know, with everything going on, and and definitely we probably are more divided than we've ever been. You sort of have these uh, what's being called today a parallel economy that that goes. You got people kind of on the woke side. Um, you know, kind of pushing some things that we don't believe in. Then we've got our side saying, well, man, we don't want to spend our money uh, and support things that we don't believe in. And you see this as much as anything in the big mobile companies. And so one of our sponsors that's been with us almost since the beginning is a company called Patriot Mobile. And we really appreciate their support. Uh, They're America's only Christian conservative wireless provider. They offer dependable nationwide coverage on all three major networks. So you're going to get the best possible service in your area. But the good news is you get to do it without the woke politics. When you switch to Patriot Mobile, you're sending a message. You support free speech, religious freedom, the sanctity of life, Second Amendment, and, of course, our military veterans and first responders. They have a 100% U.S.-based customer service team that makes switching easy. You get to keep your phone and keep your number, too. Just go to patriotmobile.com slash Phil, or you can call them at 878-PATRIOT. Get a free activation today with the offer code Phil. Patriotmobile.com slash Phil, or call them at 878-PATRIOT. So, Jay, it's just a reset, and I know you kind of had a big picture uh, discussion you want to have today where we are in the text, but so we, we got to Chapter 8 of Luke. And we've and Jesus is still in Galilee, which is up where he was raised, and he's still in that region. And so a lot of things are happening, and we're kind of heading toward that tipping point where he's going to head to Jerusalem uh, when we get to chapter nine. But we he started out with these parables that he was telling about the sower and the seeds, and then the one I call sight and sound, which is the one with the lamp on the stand, because it's as much as important about how you listen as it is and what you see. Then he kind of had this awkward family interaction where his family came. And we know from some of the other gospels that they thought he had lost it. And so they basically came to try to take him home and, you know, settle him down. But he he told him he was on a mission. Um, We had this uh, calming of the storm that you mentioned earlier, Jace, when he crossed the Sea of Galilee. And the reason he was crossing the Sea of Galilee was to interact with this guy who was possessed by literally thousands of, of demons and Jesus cast it out. And so that's what we talked about in the last podcast. So that gets us up to uh, chapter eight, verse 40, um, which is going to be a couple of uh, pretty amazing miracles uh, that we're going to talk about now. Yeah, it's a fascinating story. And I think there's, there's something in here, you know, big picture, God's nature principles that you'll see about maybe God's timing and, and really people who uh, who are more concerned with the object of their faith and how much they have, because you have the two people involved here cannot be any more different in life as yeah. far as their social status and who they are and what their request is. and But they both kind of find the same conclusion, you know, at Jesus. But... The danger of this and what we talked about before, like from a big picture, and when you think about what's happening here, Jesus is going around and he's introducing this concept of the kingdom, and he's the king. He's getting people to view him as the son of God and a son of man, and people are having a hard time doing that. I mean, you remember when he he healed the paralytic, or is that just a couple chapters back? I mean, the first thing he said was, your sins are forgiven. And it's like a record scratch moment. Cause yeah, you're chapter like, five. Yeah, in chapter five, you're like, well, wait a minute. I mean, I think it's probably the only time 
in the history of the world where someone got their sins forgiven and they were disappointed. <laughs> that's right. Because <laughs> that's not what he was there for. Yeah, it's not and, why his and, friends brought him. And I'm making that point to say I think us in modern day got to be careful as we go along here to realize that none of the disciples are really actually getting what's going on. There and, and in fact, the next chapter and the reason we're doing this break and getting the big picture today is because when you get to the next chapter, well, he sends them all out, the 12 apostles, including Judas, and they're driving yeah. out evil spirits and they're healing people, which proves a point here, which is also echoed in, uh, you know, when Jesus said, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, you know, will enter the kingdom of God. And, and you'll right. say, did we not prophesy in your name and drive out demons and do mighty miracles in your name? And he says, away from me, I never knew you. Where's that at? Matthew 7, I think. Yeah. 14 yeah. and 15. And you say, say, well, what's the point? It, it's kind of the Corinthian problem where you remember in 1 Corinthians 13, Paul makes this just incredible statement that if you can fathom all mysteries and you can give your your body to the flames and you can do all these great works but you don't have love you're nothing and uh it was really a bombshell moment because he was saying there's something better than these miracles and these signs it's pointing to jesus being the son of god once you get pointed in his direction, you see the love, the reason he's here, the love for humanity, and that love is going to trickle over to you. And, and that's yeah. the greater reason for, for studying this. But you got to remember, all these people that are watching this, that they're, not, they're not getting it. So uh, I think the danger is when you study these things paragraph by paragraph, you tend to try to apply them to your life today, but you got to realize you're, this is more of an understanding who Jesus is so that when he does die on a cross, you get it. Yeah. All these people wouldn't get it till post-resurrection. I mean, right. what happened when he died? They, they were all there. At Luke the chapter 4, it says when the sun was setting in verse 40, uh, the pe people brought to Jesus all who had various kinds of sicknesses laying on, on his hands, on each one. He healed them. Moreover, demons came out of many people shouting, you're the son of God. But he rebuked them, and he would not allow them to speak because they knew he was the Christ. At daybreak, Jesus went out to a solitary place. The people were looking for him, and when they came to where he was, they tried to keep him from leaving them. But he said, I must preach the good news of the kingdom of God to the other towns also, because that's why I was sent. Well, right. But that good news was really just that he was the king. And right. the it was because well, that, that's an excellent point, because a lot of people, they're like, well, he's going around preaching the gospel, you know, the death, burial and resurrection of Jesus. No, he, was, he hasn't died yet. That's correct. So the good news of the kingdom was that. Jesus is fulfilling the prophecy that the king was coming. And the reason I'm making such a big deal of this is is because they had a wrong view of what that kingdom was going to look like. That's why they didn't understand. Hardly any understanding of it. So in the next chapter, he's going to, for the first time, predict his death, burial, and resurrection. And they're not going to get it. So these qualities that he goes over about the kingdom, the, like the Sermon on the Mount and the character, that's giving you insight to God's nature and how we are to approach it. But and also, it, Jace, how transitional this moment was, because your point is is well taken and right spot on. I, it, I'm working on my sermon for Sunday, which I'm kind of going backwards from our podcast about the calling of the disciples. And this is something we didn't talk about back when we did it. It's easy to overlook. And I, I overlooked it when we were talking on the podcast about it. You know, Jesus chose 12 out of his current disciples. And we didn't make a big point about it. It's just a number. It's just, you know, the number he chose. But then we find out later, we get to Luke 22. That wasn't just happenstance he chose 12. He chose 12 because there were 12 tribes in Israel. 
And this was the fulfillment of everything that Israel had been looking forward to was in him. Because he makes the point to them, he says, you'll rule over, the, there's 12 of you, there'll be 12 thrones. You remember he told them as you rule over? Mm -hmm. So the idea is, is they would become the transitional figures for what Israel had known up until that point into now this recognized kingdom of God. So even little subtle things like that, Jay, to prove your point. Yeah. shows you how this whole thing is about this transition into kingdom. And you're right. No matter what application you make to your life today, it has to start there for it to make any sense. Let's take another break. You know, one of the things I'm excited about, Dad, is uh, Old Stone's going to build us a gun range out there on our property to sight in our weapons uh, a little bit better. I need a little bit of pistol work because, you know, we didn't grow up shooting pistols that much. And so, I'm not that accurate. So I think that's going to be a good use of some of our, our property there yep. uh, to get a little more proficient. And, of course, what that's going to also do uh, is increase our need for our friends from Barrel Buddy, and that's to make sure that our weapons are clean uh, because a clean weapon means a weapon that's accurate but also a weapon that's safe. And so we want that, of course, as everybody does. Uh, we love the guys at Barrel Buddy. They're believers, uh, small business like us. Uh, that came up with an idea for a product. Uh, and what they've come up with was these polymers uh, that Jay says there. And they don't leave behind any residue particles. Uh, so it cleans without making any mess. You can see what comes out of your gun barrel. In the old days, they used to use the patches. You couldn't see much out of them at all because it was a square peg, literally in a round hole. Uh, so this cleans by scrubbing, collecting all the uh, particulates, uh, and any of the remaining residue and it buffs it clean. Uh, very important to be a responsible gun owner. We know we got a lot of gun enthusiasts that listen to our podcast. So check these guys out if you hadn't already. BarrelBuddy.com, B A R R E L Buddy.com. Yeah, it's just like Nicodemus. You know, we all go there to that story and, you know, we're preaching Jesus today and we're like, you got to be born again. Well, that wasn't his, his point was you're, you're, you're under a system of law that I'm fulfilling it. The, the, the seismic shift of what he was telling Nicodemus is everything that you were taught and, and you learned and, and has made you a religious leader. I have fulfilled that, and we're going in a different direction. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> of grace and truth, and so I'm just saying to be fair to the text when you study this, you got to keep that in mind. That that really, you know, even in our day, you see religious groups who read passages like what we're fixed to read, Luke eight, which is very. It's just filled with tons of things that you know make the hair stand up on your arm and they're trying to figure out how they can have this miracle and they're missing the greater point that the miracles and the signs were pointing to jesus as the son of god now you can you know get get some encouragement from the people that came to him but it's in humility it's in yeah. weakness it's in desperation and that never, never changes. So the moral of the story is not to try to figure out why you hadn't had your miracle. He's like, I'm better than that. I, I'm yeah. what, what I'm giving you and offering you is better than the means that I'm using to show everyone that I am the son of God. Yeah, that's a, that's a great point. And, and that should be our approach. And we, we had the exact same discussion last time we were talking about demonology and demon possession and spiritual warfare, because that's the extreme on that side that everybody sees a demon and everything, you know, well, this is the demon of this and that and the other. And so you run these extremes when you study this, because you have to realize it's just my approach to coming to Christ. How am I going to come to him? Because yeah. the, in the story that we're about to talk about, you're right. In both cases, uh, Jairus, who was the synagogue ruler and the woman who is cleansed and healed from her bleeding, both came to Jesus in humility exactly. and, and not knowing what to expect, by the way, either, you know, what was going to happen. Exactly. And it's like a Hollywood movie, uh, a good one. And I'll read it. This is uh, Luke eight forty. When Jesus returned, a crowd welcomed him, for they were all expecting him. Then a man named Jairus, 
a ruler of the synagogue came and fell at Jesus' feet, pleading with him to come to his house because his only daughter, which I've noticed there's a lot of stories and miracles that happen when it's someone's only son or only daughter. Which just adds to the weight of the circumstance, don't you think, and the desperate nature. I mean, I any of your so. kids would be powerful, but if it's your only kid, if it's your only pathway, it's just well, something I also about think it's sense. subliminally or subtly, I mean, because it does keep coming up. I've noticed it over and over and over that Jesus would eventually you know, God's only son would die for, for the world. But so she was a girl about 12 and she was dying. As Jesus was on his way, the crowds almost crushed him. And a woman was there who had been subject to bleeding for 12 years, but no one could heal her. She came up behind him and touched the edge of his cloak and immediately her bleeding stopped. Who touched me, Jesus asked. When they all denied it, Peter said, Master, the people are crowding and pressing against you. But Jesus said, Someone touched me. And this is a real interesting statement. Yeah. I know that power has gone out from me. Then the woman, seeing that she could not go unnoticed, came trembling and fell at his feet. In the presence of all the people, she told why she had touched him and how she had been instantly healed. Then he said to her, Daughter, your faith has healed you. Go in peace. While Jesus was still speaking, someone came from the house of Jairus, the synagogue ruler. Your daughter is dead, he said. Don't bother the teacher anymore. Hearing this, Jesus said to Jairus, Don't be afraid. Just believe, and she will be healed. And when he arrived at the house of Jairus, he did not let anyone go in with him except Peter, John, and James, And the child's father and mother. Meanwhile, all the people were wailing and mourning for her. Stop wailing, Jesus said. She is not dead, but asleep. They laughed at him, knowing that she was dead. But he took her by the hand and said, my child, get up. Her spirit returned, and at once she stood up. Then Jesus told them to give her something to eat. Her parents were astonished, but he ordered them not to tell anyone what had happened. All right, so there's a a ton to unpack here. Um, first of all, the, the as you said, it was the only daughter of this synagogue. So this is a guy with some some pull, you know, in this community, and yet he comes to Jesus. One of the other versions, and by the way, the others are Matthew nine and, and uh, Mark eight. No, no, Matthew nine and Mark five. Yeah, uh, said he fell at his feet. And bowed before him. So, I mean, the definitely the idea here is one of humility, as you described, and 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 the same with the woman, which was kind of interesting because, you know, Jesus knew that power came out of him when she, you know, when her bleeding was stopped. And by the way, this was some sort of a um, a woman having a period that just never ended. And what's interesting is, Jason, it was the same amount of years as the girl had been alive. The little girl was 12 years old. This woman had been bleeding for the same amount of time. So I thought about it. When that baby was born is when her problem started. And I don't know if that's part of the intertwining of this or what. But. No, that's the Hollywood movie. I mean, you see what happens. You know, you're, it goes to the hospital, you know, and out walks a couple with the baby. They're happy. And then not knowing the woman who walks right beside him, yeah, she just got diagnosed with a problem that no one can cure, you know. And then so later on, yeah, twelve years, you tell the story, they're reconnected here, and now it's you got Jesus taking the girl by the hand, you know, and the and the other one, the woman is touching his cloak. I mean, we're we're talking about drama. Plus, you figured, uh, Jace, let's take our last break. You figure, Jace, you could definitely play that drama because there seems to be a race against the clock from this important man who his daughter is dying and they're trying to get him there versus this woman stopping him and taking away precious time from this kid. So just imagining again in a movie setting, you know, it's it's high drama. I heard a sermon on this and there and they uh, the preacher basically said when Jesus was was going trying to get to this girl who's dying because so this is emergency and in any you got to remember luke is a medical person so from his perspective 
you you take the most severe cases first. You put them in order in any kind of medical situation. So the uh, so the preacher was like, so basically Jesus was a, a what he did here was malpractice because <laughs> he stopped. <laughs> and, and one of the one of the other versions, either Matthew nine or Mark five, I can't remember, but. It says she told him his whole story. Well, just stop. Think about that. And I'm not trying to put people in boxes, but if a woman is fixed to tell you her whole story, <laughs> that, Get ain't some gonna, popcorn. that ain't going to happen in a hurry. <laughs> you may be I mean, there a while. I've, had, I've been involved in some of the, you know, I mean, just my wife t- telling me any story. <laughs> Dad, have you ever seen a woman who would tell you her story over and over and over again? Listen. <laughs> <laughs> this little girl, I love her to death. Never seen her before, but she showed up sa- Saturday night, I think it was. And uh, but anyway, we worked it out. She wanted me to baptize her in the river, so I shared Jesus with her. And we talked about it. But I've seen some high-strung ladies before. <laughs> but little Sheila out of Missouri, she got a great husband, and uh, but. I said, I said, girl, I've noticed something about you. And she said, what's that? I said, you are, you are, have a sense of humor and you are a go get it little girl. (laughs) She was something. Yeah. Well, I I, I didn't know about Sheila. I thought you were going to say mom. Well, that's what I thought he was going. (laughs) Sheila went way past your mother. Energy. Well, there you go. Well, I mean, I'm trying to be funny, but she's the most energetic woman I've run up on in a long time. That uh, of her fear of God and the love of Jesus Christ. I I love it. That now now she's the sister. But in, in reality, I do think that there's some some points here that do apply, even though we have kind of looked at it from the big picture about God's timing and because Jesus wasn't in a hurry. And yeah. it, it really speaks to the fact that we don't understand there's a God and we're not him. You're never going to understand, you know, God's timing. You, you, you're just not going to understand that because he just is. And so, you know, I had a guy ask me one time. You're in this time uh, frame, Jace, while you're there. During this time frame, most people were not aware that the Savior of the world was on the premises. No, that, that was the whole point of the big picture. They didn't know that. I mean, look no. at Jairus' point. He's like, my daughter's dying, and you're stopping and listening to this woman's life story. And you know, we have an emergency here. Well, yeah. what's going, there's people crowd. I mean, it just doesn't. And then she dies, and you're like... So what I was going to say is there's a principle, I think, that comes out of this also. You know, one, we don't understand God's timing. Uh, oh, what I, what I was going to say before you jumped in was it's like a, the person who asked me, well, how does God hear everyone's prayer if they're doing it at the same time? You know, y'all probably been asked that before. It, oh, yeah. It, it, it's a fair question until you realize that God's eternal. He he's not living moment by moment like we are. And I think this is a good illustration. This story is a good illustration where you would have never been able to convince this Jarius that Jesus is messing around, helping somebody else that's not life threatening. I mean, sure, she's got some problems and we hate that, but I got a twelve year old who's Dying. The the girl is dying. Come on. Jay's let's go. Ca- caught up in all this. You see that little black box right there? Yeah. Is this my Pick phone? that up. Pick that up. That right there was a valiant attempt, still is, to, to be like God. You said, Well, I mean, how's he gonna keep up with all these these prayers? And I mean, you got so many people, they're coming so many prayers. Mm. Just think of that in a way more powerful realm. I mean, yeah. that's what this is supposed to be. We've got a div. You got a device. I don't, but you have a device where you can speak into it, and millions will hear what you had to say. Yeah, that's true. That's a good point, really. But God is so much more sophisticated in that realm. Yep. But I do think there's some insights here. One thing I wanted to say, I think a principle, uh, I got this from Keller, but I think he's right. You see this in these stories that whenever you approach Jesus 
you all, it always costs you more than you think, and he gives you more than you think. And in both these stories, you really see that because the woman, she just tried to just do a drive-by healing kind of thing and grab his cloak, and there's reasons for that. Because she was an outcast, you know, under the old Jewish law and the ceremonial law, she was not allowed to even worship. And, you know, on on the other side, uh, Jarius, he was a synagogue ruler. You know, when you look at the contrast, she wasn't allowed in there because she was deemed unclean. You may have more uh, specifics on that, Al. But she was an outcast. Yeah. And so that's why she was like, well, the object of her faith was Jesus, but so she she's just wanting to touch him because she knows not that he's going to help her be healed because one of the other uh, versions accounts says that she had spent every dime she had on trying to get better to no avail. Jay says a mighty throng of people out there, and they're thinking in their head, if I can only get to to my cell phone. I know somebody will have an answer to my question. All right. Because the computer has all the answers. So to a lot of people, this is and this becomes, unfortunately, this becomes their God. All right. Because anything you want to know, instant touch, you can find out. Only God could do that for for thousands of years. Yeah. Now they got a fix on him, and to them, he becomes that thing you're looking at, brother, that becomes your God. It'll have an answer for what what you ask. But the problem is, it, it can't really, it can't really, uh, you know, no. heal diseases or or you know, raise you from the dead. I can tell you that. No. But people think so. But to Dad's point, I agree. And Dad, the difference is time. So so God operates outside of time. To Jason's point, He's yep. omniscient. He knows all things. But think about that. If we could take that black box laid on the table in front of you. And we were to go back in time. We had we we somebody created a time machine. We could go back in time. We took that box with us when you were a young boy living in that house. Yep. You know, like it was eighteen fifty. If we were to take that box and show you what all it was capable of doing, video from around the world, uh, oh. FaceTime, we could call somebody else. You could oh. see them in real time. You would think that we had come from outer space. Yep. Or, or from heaven itself. That's right. We would seem magical to you. That's and right. that's in your lifetime. That's, that's right. That, was, that would have been 70 years ago. So so the difference is time. And, and God operates outside of time, to Jason's point. So therefore, of course, he has the capacity for every human being that has ever lived. Because is f- from God's perspective, everything we're living through has already happened. Sure. I mean, yeah. You know, so I mean, it just that's shows you, you how. That's you say, how, well, the, you know, God couldn't hear. The, the prayers of all the sinners on planet Earth. What are you talking about? You've got a little yeah. black box yourself there that you can find out what sin is right here. That's well, right. Yeah. But it, I wanted it, to finish this thought before we go into overtime. So so he he made her go public, which is why she was trembling. And fair. So it did cost her more than what she wanted. But he also gave her more because he— he offered more than just a healing. He offered himself as in a relationship, in a conversation. Yeah. The fact that the Son of God is listening to you when no one else would is yeah. incredible. And Jarius, you see the same thing. He, uh, you know, he he asked him for more because he was just asking for Jesus to heal her fever, and he got way more out of it. He he got her being resurrected from the dead. Right. And it also cost him more because then when Jesus looked at him and said, trust me, after you've delayed this whole process by helping this other woman, and now she's died. And in that moment, you know, he's filled with bitterness and, and rage and grief. And then here's the same guy who you trust in just to say, well, trust me now. So, yeah. so he's asking more than he thought that would be asked. And I think it's yeah. a really good principle. No, that's really good. And we are out of time. So we'll uh, we'll pick this discussion up in the overtime uh, and probably some of the next podcast. If you want to follow us over, blazetv.com slash unashamed is where you go to get our bonus content. So we see you there. Thanks for listening to the Unashamed Podcast. Help us out by rating us on iTunes. 
And don't miss an episode by subscribing on YouTube and be sure to click that little bell to get notified about new episodes. And for even more content that you won't get anywhere else, subscribe to Blaze TV at blazetv.com slash unashamed.